As we study women's literature this semester, we'll examine a number of different time periods, places, genres, and themes. In a time when women were without many rights, there were writers who were struck by the stories of men and women alike whose lives were far more impoverished and inhumane, the lives of slaves in the British Empire and beyond. In this video, we'll take a look at a brief history of the British abolitionist movement and study some of the powerful imagery and argument employed by poets Anna Letitia Barbald, Hannah Moore, and Helen Maria Williams in their effort to see slavery abolished. The following information comes from the British Library's excellent website on the Campaign for Abolition. We can see on the timeline a trace of slavery and abolition from 1562 to 1833 uh, concerning the British Empire in particular. The slave trade in this context refers to the transatlantic trading patterns uh, which were established in Europe and the west coast of Africa. We have the first English slaving expedition by Sir John Hawkins in 1562 and so we see a centuries-long practice Unfortunately, it's not until the late 18th century that we see an actual concerted uh, effort to abolish slavery, and it would still take decades uh, for that to come to pass in the British Empire. While slavery was made illegal in Scotland in 1778, uh, that was not something applied to the rest of the UK. We do have writers, uh, just a few are noted here, uh, who were you know, calling for the abolition of slavery, and we actually see the first bill calling for the abolition or abolition of the slave trade in 1790, but it fails. And in the poetry we'll be reading uh, this week, we see Hannah Moore and Anna Letitia Barbald and Helen Maria Williams responding to uh, these hopes and failures, uh, looking at their country and despairing that there isn't enough support um, to pass these acts. Once again, in 1792, to another bill is rejected. It passes the House of Commons, but is rejected by the House of Lords. Uh, and it isn't until finally 1807 that the transatlantic slave trade is abolished by the British Parliament. Now, what that means is that the trade of slaves was abolished, but slaves who were already owned were not freed. The complete abolition of slavery was not passed until 1833. And so we can see that is quite a stretch of time here. And these are by no means the only writers uh, talking about this in their poetry. Many men, many women uh, writing essays, politicians, poets, philosophers, um, all weighing in on this issue. One of the foremost figures in this movement was a, nam a man named William Wilberforce, who advocated for the Committee of for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, uh, which first met in 1787. And so he was on the floor of Parliament arguing for abolition and met, as we saw on the timeline, failure after failure. And this poem by Anna Letitia Barbald, with its rather wordy title, Epistle to William Wilberforce Esquire on the Rejection of the Bill for Abolishing Slave Trade, uh, was written, as the title says, when one of the bills was rejected. And so we see her bitterness here, her anger, her frustration at, you know, this movement full of so many different voices uh, not being heard. And so if we take a look at her poem here, uh, I think one of the interesting things that she does is that she personifies the British Empire. So while this is ostensibly uh, addressed to Wilberforce um, in the first line, she says, cease Wilberforce to urge thy generous aim. And she's like, okay, just stop Wilberforce. We're never going to make it. And now Barbold by no means gives up on this cause. Uh, but we see this moment of doubt uh, that is any of this effort going to change anything. But the rest of the poem is really directed towards thy country, uh, towards 
the towards England, towards the British Empire. And she personifies um, England. And personification is something we see in literature uh, when we attribute human characteristics to something non-human, or we take an abstract quality and kind of put it in human form to better talk about it and understand it. And we do see the personification of a country here. And so throughout this poem, we have Barbald talking to England. She says, thy country will perforce your country, my country. Thy country knows the sin and stands the shame. The preacher, poet, senator in vain has rattled in her sight the Negro's chain. With his deep groans assailed her startled ear and rent the veil uh, that with his constant tear forced her averted eyes his stripes to scan. Beneath the bloody scourge laid bare the man. She knows and she persists. Still Afric bleeds unchecked and the human traffic still proceeds. These are powerful lines. She is, uh, Barbald is directing this speech at England saying, preachers, poets, and senators have all forced you to look at what you're doing, right? To witness your sins, uh, the enslavement of Africans and the sight of the chains, the sound of the groans, the sight of the tears, the stripes, which are wounds on a body, bloody wounds. All of this imagery um, is employed by, by Barbald and is certainly employed by William Wilberforce in the House of Parliament as he's making his argument for the inhumanity, uh, for the evil of this practice. And yet, Barbald says, she knows and she persists. England knows these things. England knows how terrible it is and still persists. And so human trafficking still proceeds. So that personification here is a powerful force uh, that Barbald is levying in her attack, essentially, against her country and her dissatisfaction with it. She further personifies um, other abstract things. Uh, not only does she give England um, a person, a gender, uh, but she also talks about England's avarice, which is greed. And she personifies certain qualities like wit and eloquence. I remember earlier in the module, we referred to Calliope, uh, the muse of poetry and eloquence. Uh, but those things fail us here, Barbal tells us. We've tried to combine our wit and eloquence, but the power of greed prevails, avarice prevails, and we fail um, in our efforts. And so she goes through different strategies throughout the poem to try to express her anger and to point out the the flaw and sin of uh, this greedy trade. And something I think she does quite interestingly as well is towards the second half of the poem, uh, she kind of reflects on beauty and poetry and uses the language of poetry to do so. And I think a little bit of background maybe helps uh, with this part of the poem if you're wondering, you know, why are we suddenly talking about uh, rural pleasure and blooming maids? Uh, there's a genre of poetry referred to as the pastoral. And this is poetry and art and, you know, other literature of any kind, uh, but that explores the relationship between humans and nature. It's known for romanticizing country life, uh, rural areas, that's where peace and beauty is to be found, as you can see in this uh, painting here. And in this part of her poem, she uses a lot of the imagery and language of a kind of pastoral poem, but she reveals that it is a lie, that there can be no beauty in these pastoral places that are worked by slaves. Um, so how can we have poetry? How can we have any beauty when there is this ugliness existing? And so she personifies beauty, 
and um, gives beauty a person and says what beauty is now doing. Beauty is contriving torture and inflicting wounds. Uh, there is no rural pleasure in palmy walks and spicy groves, no cheerful labor or blooming maids. Uh, so this is referring directly to this pastoral genre, uh, which in poetry and paintings would often depict, um, you know, country laborers, but ones who loved their work. And we should be inspired by their life of simplicity and their their healthy, full red cheeks as they you know, labor out in uh, the country. But that's a fantasy. Who is doing most of the labor? Slaves. And so she's dispelling this, this fantasy. And she says, okay, what you would actually hear and see would be shrieks and yells that disturb the balmy air, dumb, sullen looks of woe announced despair, and angry eyes through dusky features glare. I think it's a very artful piece of poetry to kind of turn poetry on its head, essentially. Uh, she's almost parodying a kind of poetry, which often personifies qualities like beauty and grace, and uses them to make an argument against slavery, uh, to use a poem that in happier times could be about beautiful things, but can't afford to be when there are important things on the table. And we see Hannah Moore chiming in too. Um, another prominent poet of the period, uh, Anna Letitia Barbald, uh, was quite well known, has written about many things. Uh, and Moore has, and this is what we're reading actually, is just an excerpt from a lengthy poem called The Slave Trade. Uh, but it's very much a work of powerful rhetoric. And rhetoric is the art of persuasion, of making arguments. And in many ways, this poem is an argument. It employs logos uh, for thinking of the Aristotelian uh, Greek uh, form of argumentation. You might be familiar with logos, pathos, and ethos. So logos is logic. If I employ logos in, our, in an argument, I'm trying to appeal to my reader's reasoning their logic to convince them of something. If I'm appealing to pathos, I'm trying to get my readers to feel something. I'm trying to use their emotions uh, to make my argument. And Hannah Moore, I think, very successfully uses both of these elements in this poem. And it's fitting that she would use logic um, and not just emotion. Uh, this, the era of enlightenment is also known as the age of reason. It is a time of logic and thinking um, in politics and science and in poetry as well. And so she makes a logical argument here for abolishing slavery, for its, for its unethical, inhumane nature. She asks rhetorical questions and then gives us the answer, though. Uh, she says, what? Does the immortal principle within change with the casual color of a skin? Does matter govern spirit or is mind degraded by the form to which it is joined? No, they have heads to think and hearts to feel and souls to act with firm though erring zeal. So she asks us, okay, whatever makes us immortal, whatever soul we have, whatever thing makes us human, does that suddenly change if skin color is different? Um, what is more powerful, matter, the body and what it looks like, or spirit, the mind, what is inside? And she says, well, no, if you were to look at these slaves, they have heads to think and hearts to feel and souls to act. And so how can you treat them differently. So she expresses her logical argument here. But she also employs pathos uh, by appealing to the reader's emotions through powerful imagery. And imagery um, is, of course, um, an important ingredient in lots of poetry. Uh, efforts on the part of the poet to use words to give visuals and other sensory descriptions. And if you are trying to impress upon your reader uh, the awful torture of something like slavery, using pathos-driven imagery would be essential. And she does here. Uh, we see her describe, whenever to Africa's shores I turn my eyes, 
Horrors of deepest, deadliest guilt arise. I see by more than fancy's mirror shoon the burning village and the blazing town. See the dire victim torn from social life. See the scarred infant. Hear the shrieking wife. So she's almost commanding us here. She's saying, I see it. It haunts me. It's horrific. And you need to see it. See the dire victim. See the scarred infant. Hear the shrieking wife. And so this poem is very much an argument about the slave trade. Uh, it's, poetry here is being used politically uh, and is meant to be published and change minds. And then finally, we have Helen Maria Williams, another poem with a lengthy title because she's reflecting on like a very specific moment in history on the bill which was passed in England for regulating the slave trade a short time before its abolition. And now she actually uh, wrote this poem a bit prematurely because it was written uh, when yet another bill was going to get rejected again and she edited it and republished it later after finally it did pass. So she lived uh, to see it change. So this is definitely a pathos-driven poem, very much using imagery once again to reach the reader's emotions. And I'll leave it to you to take a look at the poem um, and the rest of the other poems too, uh, to analyze which parts you think are most powerful, uh, which images do you think are employed by the poets uh, most successfully in I can't really say beautifully in this case, so more so what is the ugliest imagery that is most convincing? Uh, what role does a poet play uh, in political debates? It's not something we maybe see or maybe think of quite as much now when we think about politics, but poetry has long been political. Uh, literature has often been a means to reach people and reach minds and change hearts. And that's what we see in these poets seeking to do.